Praise God. Let's go to God in prayer as we continue to look at His Word. Father, we just thank You, Lord, for Your grace and Your Word. We ask, O God, that You continue to teach us in regards to Your Word of grace and give us a biblical understanding, O God, of this that You have revealed in Your Word. Touch us, O God, afresh with Your Spirit and cause us to understand and to know the fullness of of your grace towards us. We may appreciate and understand, O oh God, what you have given to us in Christ and the means by which we can attain to and grow in the grace of God. Thank you, Father God, for this understanding that you gave. And we ask that once again the Holy Spirit of wisdom and revelation rests upon our hearts and our minds, open the eyes of our understanding, that we may be enlightened that we may know afresh the hope of your calling, the riches of your inheritance in the saints, and the exceeding greatness of your power towards us who believe. Thank you, Father God. We give you glory, we give you honor, we give you praise. And let your word continue, Lord, to be like a two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, causing us, O oh God, to love you, to worship you, to bow before you and acknowledge you as our God, our Lord, our Savior, our Master, our Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. We thank you, Father, for all that you are, and we worship you, and we covenant, Lord, that we always give you the worship, the glory, and the honor for all that you do, O oh God, in our lives, all that you have done, and all that you are about to do. We give you thanks, Father, because you are a good and wonderful Father to each one of us. And we give you worship and glory forevermore. In Jesus' name. And everyone say, Amen. Amen. Praise God. And uh, we are on a series on understanding the grace of God. And uh, this time we want to look at what I call the law of grace. And uh, understand that... Uh, if you study a series on grace in the Bible, especially in the book of Romans, you would note that uh, uh, grace actually sets us free from the law. But there is a higher law, which is called a spiritual law, which operates grace. And uh, So let's lay down some scriptures uh, for a moment. In the book of uh, Romans chapter 4, Romans chapter 4, we read first from uh, verse 4. It says, Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Just as David also ascribed the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. And then uh, lower down, it says here in uh, <clears throat> verse 13 and uh, 14. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law. It's not through the Mosaic law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are as faith is made void. And the promise... Of no effect. In other words, it contrasts uh, in verse 16. It says, If it is of faith, that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So it contrasts between the Mosaic law and the grace of God. And saying that the grace of God is given to us uh, outside of the law and uh, before the law even came. And it says that how God relates to us is through faith so that it be by grace, not of work. So works and law opposite of grace. Uh, let's add one more scripture to the whole puzzle. And that is Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8, it says here in verse 1 and 2, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh. 
but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life, that's the new law. It says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. And then we have two laws, a lower law and a higher law. And that's why we call grace and uh, the law of grace. It functions on a different level. It functions on the law of faith. It functions uh, beyond the Mosaic law. And it is not of works. It is of faith. And there's a reason behind it. Uh, let's look also at uh, Ephesians chapter 2. We like to put all the scriptures together. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. And see the contrast again. It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Again, it contrasts works versus grace. If it's of works, it is no more of grace. If it's of the law, it is no more of grace. If it's earned by the law and merits of the law, then it is no more of grace. The contrast is tremendous. Now let's have a practical application. And one of the good ones is found from 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And here is Paul who actually struggles with this concept of grace in, the early, in, uh, in his uh, early times of understanding the grace of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he speaks in a third person regarding the revelations that he has received. And then he concludes with verse 7 to verse 10. If you have 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 to verse 10. It says, Unless I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, he says, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. So Satan was uh, coming against him and he pleaded to the Lord three times. And then the Lord said to him, My grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. And then Paul answers, Therefore, most gladly I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses. For Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. And thus, the law of grace is operating here. Now, let's examine these words. He says, when I am weak, then am I strong. And God even says, my grace is sufficient for you. And he says, my strength is made perfect in weakness, not in strength. Could we take the opposite? That if Paul says he's weak, then he is strong. Does it then mean that if he is strong in himself, then he's actually weak in grace? If he's weak in himself, which he's feeling weak at the moment, as he is buffeted by the enemy and by Satan's forces. And of course, he also has his infirmities that he has got from his physical persecution, a part of it. But in all that he's going through, Paul is feeling physically weak. And then he says, when he's in this weakness, then the grace of God is strong upon him. Does it mean then that, that if he is strong, then the grace of God is weak? How is that contrast measured? Is it true then that the secret and one of the laws of grace or tapping upon the grace of God and that's why we talk about the law of grace. The law of grace tells us how to flow and tap upon grace. If the law of grace is such that when we are weak then are we strong, then indeed we need to find a place where when we feel strong, we need to learn how to deny ourselves so that we be weak in Him, that the grace of God can continue to abound. If that is true. 
well let's have more scriptures added to the whole bundle in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 10 here's another scripture that points to the paradox of grace I can call it where for some reason grace flows when we are weak and it stops flowing when we are strong in ourselves in 1 Corinthians 15 and uh, verse 10 but by the grace of God I am what I am and his grace toward me was not in vain but I labor more abundantly than they all yet not I but the grace of God which was with me so here Paul talks within himself there is a possibility of two ways in which he could do things he could do it by himself and his strength or he could allow the grace of God to work through him and for some reason when it's by the grace of God he could actually do more than he did by him, his own strength he says he labored more abundantly more than he could do on his own when the grace of God abounds upon his life there are two forces that Paul says is working within him one is himself the other is the grace of God and apparently this grace does work but yet Paul says he recognized it's not him it was something else moving him something else energizing him and that's the paradox of grace that Paul speaks about one additional scripture in 2nd Corinthians chapter 4 2nd Corinthians chapter 4 he again speaks about this paradox of grace where when he is weak then he is strong in 2nd Corinthians chapter 4 he starts off with this place in verse 7 and 8 where he says we are hard pressed on every side yet not crushed perplexed not in despair persecuted not forsaken struck down not destroyed always caring about in the body in verse 10 the dying of the Lord Jesus do you notice that not the resurrection power yet but he says here in verse uh, 11 uh, 10 and 11 he says we are carrying about in the body that is in the flesh the dying of the Lord that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body for we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus sake that the life of Jesus also may be manifest in our mortal flesh and here's the paradox in verse 12 so then death is working in us but life in you again the contrast the paradox sounds like John chapter 15 verse 5 where Jesus says without me you can do nothing but he says abide in me and let my words abide in you and he tells us we will bear much fruit more fruit than we could ever bear on ourselves and this is the paradox of grace everyone talks about grace but how do we tap upon this grace apparently this grace is a type of energizing that is received and here we ask a question in 2nd Corinthians chapter 12 why did it take three times for God to answer Paul why three times now Paul as you know is a man of prayer Paul was an apostle to the Gentiles Paul was a teacher of the Word of God and Paul by that time had been had great experience in the ministry of God why did it take Paul three times he says he cried three times to the Lord in order to overcome this buffeting that he was experiencing from the angel of the of the uh, of satan he says why three times and how did he know that the answer comes how does he know when the answer came when when he cried three times what was the difference in the third time is it that God just spoke to him the word and says Paul my grace is sufficient for you my strength is made perfect in weakness 
Why, what, what happened during the third time? What was the mystery behind the third time? Why didn't God answer the first two times? What was the struggle? We could give a few answers or hypothetical answers to that. Uh, and I'm sure we we'll have no shortage of some theories and answer. Uh, one thing for sure, that in the first two times, Paul was still fighting in his own strength. There's something in the Bible that talks about learning to rely on God's strength. And Paul was, would be fighting in his own strength. He says, because of the abundance of revelations, all these things were happening. And in the first two times, he was struggling. I'm sure he struggled against that. Something happened on the third time. Something marvelous, something deep within him. I believe among those things that happened, firstly, Paul accepted his situation. Part of grace is to be able to embrace the situation. Not so much to resist it as it is to embrace it and allow God from within to do the fighting for us. Like the old song that we used to sing long ago among the early charismatic. Uh, it goes something like, Glory, Jesus, glory. You do the fighting for me. Praise you, Jesus, praise you. In you there's always victory. There's something about allowing Jesus to fight for us. In the Old Testament, of course, they don't have Jesus living in them, but they have the same concept. Remember how many times they were about to take their weapons and fight? And then God says, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Now, sometimes they still need to go out and fight. And they go out and do their little bit. But, primarily, they had to depend on the Lord fighting for them. So in the Old Testament, there is also an understanding of this methodology of grace, of allowing the Lord to fight for us. And so some of the things that they did are very strange when they allowed the Lord to fight for them. One of the things was in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, when King Jehoshaphat was told by the Lord that uh, when they were surrounded by all the enemies, uh, and the Lord says that fear not, He has already given them the victory. And then they say, okay, if the Lord has given us a victory, what should we do? And so they decided to appoint singers to go ahead and praise the Lord. And it says in the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 20, if you have your Bible, that they did some things. It's not that they didn't do anything. The Lord said everything was theirs. Right? There was still something that they needed to do. Second Chronicles chapter 20. Uh, the background of the story was in verse 14 and 15. When they were surrounded by the enemy, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of ben Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Metaniah. Well, wow, he's really gave under the great-grandfather's name. <laughs> Praise God. And it says, uh, A Levi of the sons of Asaph. Asaph was a musician. In the midst of the assembly. And it says, Listen, all you of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, you King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, Do not be afraid, nor dismayed, because of this great multitude. Now, there was a lot of soldiers. There were more soldiers than they could fight. For the battle is not yours, but God's. And he says, tomorrow, go down against them. They will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. And he says, you will not need to fight in this battle. You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, 
who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. Now that's the kind of fight you want to be in. Where the Lord is already doing the fighting, and all you do is cooperate with the Lord, and you go down with the Lord. Now all those things are wonderful. The prophecy was wonderful. But you and I are interested in the practical application. Alright, the Lord said say that. The Lord promised this. What actually did they do? Because that's the part that seals. That seals the whole deal. In chapter 20, when they consulted with all the people, and uh, verse 21, he consulted with the people, he appointed those who sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of holiness. And they went out before the army. They were saying, Praise the Lord for His mercy endures forever. That's all they did. They went say, and said, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. There's no army that fights like that. <laughs> Imagine sending an army and all they go is PTL, PTL. Now praise the Lord. <laughs> and uh, that's the whole victory. But notice in verse 22, I always like to see when something turns around, not just the theoretical, prophet, prophetic part and all the promises. I like to see the exact moment, the exact second, the exact place and time when the manifestation comes. It says here in verse 22, Now when they began to sing and to praise the Lord, the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir who had come against Judah and they were defeated. Now you notice the timing. When they began to sing. When they began to worship. When they began to praise the Lord. That was when the promises start taking place. See, all of us want to know the grace of God. We are taught grace is important. We need grace in this life. And in uh, John chapter 1, it says that from Him we receive grace upon grace. And life is about uh, receiving the grace of God. One of the laws of how this grace operates, we know that grace will operate when we are weak, then are we strong. But how does that operate? What did Paul felt on the third time? Something akin to this. See, if Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 10, by the grace of God, I am what I am, and he says that uh, he labor more abundantly, yet not I, but the grace of God within him, it means that there are two energy forces he could feel on his inside. One is himself, Paul, the I. Where he says, it's not I, but the grace of God. So there's an I which is himself, and then there's the grace of God. And what happens is that he could sense that when he labored abundantly, it was not the I, but the grace of God. There was some energy force. So what is this grace of God? What do we mean by we receive the grace of God? What do we mean by, by de depend on the grace of God? And it answers the question, what happened on the third time that Paul cried to the Lord? When he says, God, help me. What happened on the third time? What did Paul experience? However we may visualize it and theorize, definitely on the third time, Paul would have felt and energizing. See, grace is energy. It is spiritual energy, not natural energy. In 2 Corinthians chapter 20, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, same place where we left off just now, it says that when God replied to him the third time, God says, My grace is sufficient for you. My strength. And the word strength is the Greek word dunamis. My power. My spirit energy's power is made perfect in weakness. 
So something happened to Paul the third time. As he cried the first time, nothing happened. He cried the third time. We do not know how long it was between the, the three cries. And he cried the second time, nothing happened. But as he turned to God the third time, recognizing that he got no more strength, something happened. A new impartation of energy came into his being. So grace is an energy that is imparted when you recognize that your own energy and strength is insufficient. We need sometimes to reach the end of our energy before we tap on the grace of God. Now, if we could straight away depend on God's energy, that would be wonderful. Uh, so many times we don't realize we're running on our own energy because we get carried away or we get uh, into a mode of momentum grace. And then we don't realize that uh, uh, the grace and new energy is not being imparted. Remember, uh, grace is an impartation of God's energy. And with each impartation of energy, you are carried forward. Using the illustration of momentum grace, uh, as your car is energized and pushed forward or pulled forward by the engine, and it got pulled forward until it's traveling at 100 kilometers per hour. If all the engine shuts down, the energy that is there will carry on in momentum until friction stops the car. So there is the inherent energy there, except that it will not last forever because you need fresh energy to come. How wonderful if we could keep tapping on that fresh energy that comes from God each time. And then we will always find God's energy flowing within us. How wonderful if we, like Paul, could in 2 Corinthians uh, 4 recognize that it is through the dying in the Lord Jesus Christ that the life of Jesus could come within us. If we could come to the point to recognize that we are always weak and He is always strong, that we are always nothing and He is always our everything, that we in ourselves are like Paul says, He is the chief of sinners. But yet in God, He was an apostle of the great and mighty God. Where you could contrast the two and recognize that in ourselves, we are all rotten to the core. But it is God in us who strengthens us, who energizes us. It would be wonderful if we could constantly tap on the energy. But the key is to recognize that we are nothing. He is everything. The key is to recognize that in ourselves, we cannot do it. Same as Proverbs 3, 5, 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge Him in all your ways and He will direct your paths. Recognizing that it's not by works, the law of grace. We need to recognize it's not by works. Not by any of our works. Not by anything that we can do. As we keep daily recognizing that, like Paul calls it, the dying in the Lord Jesus Christ. He says it's a daily crucifying, a daily dying. Then we continually tap on this energy of God that comes upon him. So I believe what happened on the third time as he cried to God. Perhaps he is at the end of himself. You know, almost like Moses who stood between the mountain, the Egyptians, and the Red Sea. Nothing that he can do. There's nothing that he can do. You have to depend on God. It's nice to be in a situation where you have to trust the Lord. But sometimes we've got to be placed in a situation where you've got no one to turn to, you've got no one you can rely on, you've got nothing on this planet they can rely on. The only person you can rely on is the Lord. That's when you're ready for the grace of God. 
it's funny, we always must come to that place. Which is why God gives grace to the humble. Always coming to the position where we can't do it on our own. We need the grace of God. When Moses was surrounded by the Egyptians on one side, the mountains on one side, the Red Sea on one side, that was when he can depend on God. And God says, Moses, what do you have in your hand? And he just had to lift up the rod, which represents the anointing that God gave him, the grace that God gives him to operate the anointing, and then the Red Sea parted. And they did something that no nation in the world has ever recorded again. You never hear of it happening again. Of a people crossing a sea that is a, with a pathway made through the sea on dry land, with the waters on two sides formed like a wall. You have never heard of it again. That's the grace of God. That God can work when we trust and depend on Him. So the first law of grace is to understand that it's not by works, and you can phrase the first law differently, that it, grace can only operate in times of weakness and need. As long as we haven't come to the place of need and weakness, we do not know what the grace of God is like. So is it necessary? Yes, Hebrews chapter 4. When you read Hebrews chapter 4, it talks about coming to God in verse uh, 15 and 16. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Then he turns around in verse 16 and says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now this need doesn't just cover physical needs. I'm sure it does cover. But that means that if there's any occasion in your life, any situation in our lives in this grace dispensation, if you need encouragement, you come to the point you're so discouraged and down, that's when it's time to ask for grace. That's when it's time to turn to God and go to the throne of grace and say, God, I need grace. Now, grace is imparted on each occasion. It is not like you receive grace the day you were born again, full stop. Grace continues to be imparted, otherwise Hebrews 4 wouldn't be true. It's not just saying, God, okay, I got the grace of God when I was born again. No, it seems that in every situation, you, we all need a fresh measure of grace. Otherwise, the scripture, grace upon grace does not operate because there is a grace upon grace. There is a scripture that says that in Him is fullness of grace and it abounds to us as grace upon grace in John chapter 1. So whenever we have a time of need, when you are in a place where you are discouraged, that's when you say, God, I need to find your grace. Or when you're in a time of, uh, uh, it could be a physical need, maybe you're surrounded by every situation, there's no help from anything that you can. You try all you can and there's no help. You're like Moses, one side the Egyptians, one side the mountain, one side the sea. That's when you say, Lord, I need your grace. That's when we can tap on the grace of God. Because it's in those times that we learn. And in the New Testament, this is what we learn to do. In every situation, whether it be a spiritual situation, because sometimes you could be uh, spiritually exhausted and you need spiritual strengthening. It could be a soul situation where you need to be strengthened. It could be a physical situation where you need healing or provision. It could be any area and you reach a point and you say, God, there is no other help but you. That's when you have the greatest potential to tap on the grace of God. Because that's when you're nothing. That's when you're weak. And that's when you can come to the throne of grace. And God will impart 
grace upon you. Now, don't leave the first time. You know why Paul prayed three times? Because it's only on the third time he received an impartation. We sometimes have to wait at the throne of God until the energizing is complete. We have to get into the place of God and allow God to pour His grace upon our life, to energize us from inside. And when the energizing of grace comes upon us, your question is, how do I know when the energizing is complete and finished? Because there will be energizing. And when the energizing comes within you, suddenly you will know what to do. Suddenly you will know what areas to perform. And it might not be much. It might be just the little bit that God asked you to do. The little bit that God asked Moses to raise his hand with the rod. That's not much to do. He didn't ask God, ask Moses to go and try to push the Red Sea away. That's a tough job. That's not for Moses, that's for the angel. All Moses has to do is lift up the rod. The little part that he wants us to do, the energizing. And as you begin to flow in the energizing, where Paul says, it is no longer I, he says, but the grace of God that labor more abundantly. He could feel another energy force, not himself moving him. That's the grace of God. If you haven't come to that stage yet, press in. How do we recognize when that stage comes? Remember what we say, show in the Old Testament when they began to sing, then God started turning the ambush of the enemy. There's something about the grace of God when it comes upon our life. When the grace of God comes into your life, it comes with a song. I show it in the Bible. In the book of Colossians, chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. In Colossians chapter 3, although it talks about the Word of God, it ends with the impartation of grace. Three verse 16. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in Psalms, hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Notice that, singing with grace in your heart. When grace comes, there is worship. When grace comes, worship and praises come within you. So it takes you through all the various stages. Say, what were the stages in warfare with the grace of God in the spiritual and the natural dimension? The Bible says we do not wrestle with flesh and blood, but we wrestle with spiritual weapons way beyond the natural. And in this wrestling in God, it deals with forces that are different. The first thing that we need to know and that we need to understand, of course, is the love of God. We know that it's the love of God that establishes us. The love of God and our relationship with the Father that establish who we are. Uh, better give you all the scriptures, although you know them by now. In the book of Romans chapter 8, it tells us here in verse 28, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the call according to His purpose. So the first thing that needs to take place is that the love of God must come forth in our life first. I mean, if, if God is not there in our life, if we don't love God, nothing else works. Every test, trial and temptation is designed with only one purpose, to see whether we love God. 
of course, to also see whether we love people. But the prime design is that God is testing our heart to see whether we love Him. And if we choose to love God, we choose to come to God, then no matter what situation you are in, no matter whether you're in a spiritual situation of distress, soul situation of distress, physical situation of distress, you say it in your own heart that you will always love the Lord. When you have abundance, you will love Him. When you lack, you will love Him. When you are in health, you will love Him. When you are confronted with sickness and disease, you will still love Him. When you are in ease, you will love Him. When you are in pain, you will love Him. When you are on the mountain, you will love Him. When you are in the wilderness, you will love Him. When you are in the storms, you will love Him. When you are in the calm, you will love Him. When you are set in your own heart, first, primarily, that love will always be there for the Lord. No matter what happens, no one can steal the love of God from you. You determine and you choose to love God. And you don't love God just because of plenty. You will love God in all situations. When you have said that in your heart, you have cleared the first hurdle. Three hurdles. Say, what? Three hurdles? Yes. Love is just the first one. The second thing that will take place because you hold on to love is peace. Peace will come. You love God so much that the peace of God comes. See, love and peace are very close behind one another. You find it in the book of Romans chapter eight, uh, chapter 5. It tells us in Romans 5, love and peace are very, very close together. In verse, verse 1, it says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by which we stand, we have access by faith. And then he talked about not only, but we also glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, perseverance, character, character, hope. Hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured upon our hearts, has been shared abroad in our hearts. So it was the love of God that actually produced that peace. So we have to love God and love God. And at first, when you choose to love God, it doesn't seem to be easy. But if you keep choosing to love God, something takes place. The peace of God comes. And then you know you're on the second level. In Romans chapter 16, verse 20, and that takes place. In Romans 16, verse 20, it says, And the God of peace. It didn't say the God of love. It didn't say the God of power. It says, The God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. That means it's still in the process of happening. Do you notice that it's the God of peace who crushed Satan under your feet? So when you continue to choose love and you lay all your burdens upon the Lord, peace comes. And immediately after that, he says in verse 20, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Notice grace comes very shortly. Peace comes, grace comes. Let me point to the same flow in Colossians. Uh, in the book of uh, Colossians, that we read just now. In verse 15. Look at verse 15 that takes place before verse 16. It says, And let the peace of God rule in your heart, to which also you will call in one body and be thankful. Now you know what happened on the third time when Paul cried. Remember Paul cried three times. He was being buffeted by a fallen angel of Satan. And he cried unto the Lord. Nothing happened. Second time, he cried unto the Lord. Nothing happened. Now of course he loved the Lord. The third time, he cried unto the Lord. That's when he must have experienced the peace of the Lord. Peace cometh. Peace cometh. 
when the peace comes, then you know Satan is being crushed. And you think about this life. Think about everything you experience in this life. It is not so much the lack of money, but the lack of peace that troubles you. Because if you lack money, but you have the peace of God, like Matthew 6, you could easily trust the Lord. And you could still worship the Lord knowing the Lord will provide. And you don't have a care in the world. Whether, you know, on the, on the day that you lack and the money hasn't shown up yet, that you have to go out to the grass and cut some grass to eat. <laughs> but the peace of God is in you. It didn't bother you that much because you got peace. Or if you're in a situation that has no solution, and what happens when people have a situation where there's no solution? They don't have peace. They don't have peace. They can't sleep. They have all kinds of trouble. But when peace comes, something takes place. So peace starts coming in. Satan is being crushed. Then you know that the energizing is beginning. Because now it's no more your battle. Now the battle is the Lord's. That's how grace operates. That's why grace is tied up to the love of God, to the peace of God. And the third stage, the third stage, when the prophets declare to Jehoshaphat, the battle is the Lord's, it is not yours, I'm sure a peace came upon the people. Because otherwise the people are all troubled. Don't forget, this is a real life situation. They're surrounded by, by soldiers. Every one of them could be killed. Their lives were at stake. When the prophets declared what the Lord has said, there must have been a calm and a peace that takes place. But that is part of the solution. One more thing they needed to do. They needed to sing and praise. Okay, that is what happened when the peace of God is full and the grace of God comes. When the grace of God comes, He puts into your heart a new song. Now, for you, it could be a song that you know. It could be an old song. But for you at that time, it is a song. It is a praise. It is a worship that you can bring before God. A declaration or whatever it sounds. It is a new tone. A new sound. It might not be exactly like a full melody. But it is a new sound. A new tone that is on your inside that, that comes for a victorious tone. And you know that victory is yours. You receive the victory before the victory comes. Like the Israelites as they went around the walls of Jericho. On the last seven days, they all shouted with one voice. Whatever sound or, or, or word that they were coordinated to shout. And when they shouted with that one sound, the walls of Jericho came down. Inside each one of us is music. There is a music of our hearts. Even in the natural world, there is a rhythm to your heartbeat. There's a rhythm to the way your, the blood is supplied through all your organs and tissues. Your heartbeat is nature's rhythm. And you know that our heartbeat changes pace with different things. When it gets excited, it beats a different rhythm. Right? When sometimes some of you could be in a situation, or maybe you're watching a wrong movie, and the music goes, always the same music. Dang, nah, nah, nah. Not that no. one. And your heartbeat goes boom, 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 boom. Your heartbeat changes. Your rhythm changes. These are music. It might be not the music that you and I know that goes by all the 88 keys of the piano or the, or the chords of the guitar. But these are music. These are sounds. There is a music that beats in our spirit. There's a music that beats in our heart. And that music changes. 
Not the music of our heart, but something deeper, deep in our spirit, deep within our soul. It's called the melody of the spirit. And you know how many times God tells us, sing a new song unto the Lord. Sing a new song unto the Lord in the book of Psalms. Praise Him with a new song. Worship Him with a new song. And in the Old Testament, you notice, every time they overcame the enemy, they always have a song. David always have a song. And remember what they did when they overcame and saw the Israelites drown. They sang unto the Lord with timbrels and the women were dancing. And of course, today they composed a song, which might not be the same song. But our song is, I will sing unto the Lord, for He has triumphed gloriously, the horse and the rider thrown into the sea. That's from the Old Testament. They sang a song unto the Lord. And they were dancing unto the Lord because that song was a song of victory. Now the song didn't come to them after the victory. It was already there. They were rejoicing. It was just bursting forth in worship to God. Even in the book of Revelations, do you know that every time something happens, there's a new song to heaven. There's a new praise. And 144,000 sang a new song that no one else can sing. Because it's all new songs and new sounds. When the grace of God cometh, it produces vibrations in us. Energy is vibration. In the natural law, all energy is vibrations and movements. Uh, whether you want to call it wavelength or energy, so, or whether you want to call it particles or wavelength, it's all energy flowing, all vibration. Light is all vibrations of different things. Different colors of light are all light at different frequencies. Everything is a vibration. It points to something deeper in the spiritual realm, that there is a vibration of victory. When grace comes, grace is an energy. Dunamis. When it comes, there is a vibration of energy and that energy comes upon Paul. You could almost hear Paul singing in 2 Corinthians 12. Now, he might not be a singer because not all preachers are singers. We know that Kenneth E. Hagin, he uh, senior, he couldn't sing. One thing he couldn't do, he couldn't sing. And in one of his uh, sermons, he says, he even tried to take music lesson and singing lesson. His teacher gave up on him. <laughs> but he could have a new tone in some way. I'm not sure how good the Apostle Paul was in singing, but we do know he did say, I will pray in the Spirit. I will sing with the Spirit. So we know he can at least sing in the Spirit. Sing in tongues. So some of you might not be able to carry a normal tune, but you still can sing in tongues. There is a song. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're all good singers or good musicians, but there is a vibration of energy, a tone of victory, a melody in our heart. Like Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18 and 19. When we are filled with the Spirit of God, it says, uh, speaking in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, and that's for everyone, not for some people. That scripture is for everyone. And it says in verse 19, making melody, making melody in our heart to the Lord. And that's again for everyone, not for some. And so here we have Paul. Here is where you can almost hear him singing. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He says in verse 8 and 9, Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. Then he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now here is where he sounds like he's almost singing. Therefore most gladly. Yeah, he's happy. Can you see the word? The happiness is coming. Most gladly. Joy has come. So love, peace, joy. Do not stop in the presence of God with love alone. As you press in into every situation, you press in and remain there until God fills you. Why? Because in the presence of God is fullness of joy. 
And remember the last sermon that Jesus preached before he went to the cross, John 14, 15 and 16. What was the theme in the sermon? The theme in the sermon was not sadness. Jesus did not say, it's going to be a very sad day. I'm about to die. You all better be sad. It's terrible like a woman willing. We're all going to die. You're all going to be scattered. Oh, horror, horror of horrors. His sermon didn't come out like that. John 14, it says, Peace I live with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world give do I give unto you. John 14, 27. He says, In my father's house are many mansions. And then he talks about joy. He says, I give you joy, not like the world gave. And no one can take away this joy. And he says, you will, you will have distresses, you are tribulation, like a woman giving birth. But then when she has a child, she rejoices and she forgets all the tribulation because of the joy of the child. The emphasis was joy. It was a tone of victory. It was a song of victory. It was a sermon of victory unto the Lord. Because when grace cometh, it brings joy. So when you have the grace of God, in the same measure that Paul has, Paul cried three times. Some of you might have cried 666 times. <laughs> Cry one more time. How do we know that we have touched the grace of God? How do we know we're not going to live on our own strength? When you have graduated from love, into peace, into joy. And remember at which stage the devil was being crushed? At the peace stage. At the love stage is contact with God. At the peace stage is where God starts crushing the de devil. At the joy stage is when you have been touched by the presence of God. Because in the presence of God is fullness of joy. And if you have been in God's presence, how did God say to come into His presence? Did God say, enter into His courts with mourning? Drag your feet to the altar? No. There is a time for mourning and repentance. But He says, enter into His gates with thanksgiving. And into his courts with praise. Remember what God did not permit in the Old Testament when the anointing came? God did not allow tears. Strange, isn't it? In the Old Testament, one of the first, they were all new to God's presence. So the presence of God came upon the Old Testament people in the tabernacle that Moses built. And then there was an accident. Aaron had two sons, uh, three sons actually. But two of his sons, Nadab and Abihu, they died. They died because they must have taken the fire from somewhere and tried to offer as an offering. And on the spot, they died. Can you imagine as a father losing two sons in one day? You feel sad. And the first thing that Moses told Aaron, and Aaron was his brother, elder brother, do not cry. Because the anointing all of God is on you. Implying that if he shed tears, he will also die. Wow, that takes control. Can you imagine? So sad he wants to cry. But he make sure the tears don't come. Because if the tears come, he dies. Tough call. Talk about controlling your emotions. Some of you thought, wow, so tough. Wait till you were like Aaron, the anointing all is on you. Which father don't want to cry for the two sons that died? And Moses says, you, can, you cannot cry, let the others cry for you. Easier said than done. What a cruel younger brother he is. Right, don't forget, Aaron is an older brother. He's a Moses' younger brother. And he says, the anointing all is on you. Why such instruction? In the presence of God, there is no sorrow. Let me ask you this question. 
Is there any tears and sorrow in heaven? There is none. Do you know that if you go to heaven and you find sorrow there, it would not be heaven? You probably go to the wrong section. <laughs> Should I go up? You could go up, you went down, wrong section. <laughs> you went to heaven. Now, there's no doubt that God wiped away the tears. But those got to be wiped away because in heaven, there's no more crying. No more sorrow. Because tears and sorrow come from imperfection. Heaven is perfection. And when you're touched by heaven and the grace of God come upon you, a part of heaven sinks into you. And no wonder Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And he says, I labor more abundantly, yet not I, but the grace of God in me. You know what it was like? We read theoretically, oh, that's the grace of God. But you know, do you know what the grace of God feels like? It feels like liquid joy being imparted upon you. And when it comes upon you, you could almost sing that song, Nehemiah 8 verse 10. The joy of the Lord is my strength. No wonder Paul says, the grace of God in him caused him to do more than he could do by himself. That is the difference between works and grace. Grace still works. But grace works more powerfully and you're so relaxed and joyful. How many of you have problem doing something that you enjoy so much? You want to do more, not less. But whatever you don't enjoy, it's a hard work. That is why when the curse came in the book of Genesis 3, God says to man, you will eat by the sweat of your brow. I mean, it's hard work. You don't enjoy it. It's horrible, like slavery. And it sucks your energy, and yet you cannot go forward. But when the grace of God comes into our life, the law of grace is such that when we are weak, then we are strong, and it produces joy. The law of the spirit of life is joy in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll prove it to you. It's in the book of Romans 8-2. It's all over the place. This truth is so clear, yet people cannot see it. In Romans chapter 8, it, it says in verse uh, 2, the law of the Spirit is life in Christ Jesus. Now, what is this life in Christ Jesus? It tells us here that... Uh, <clears throat> In uh, verse 5, those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And if you examine the word zoe and the life of God, you will find that Zoe life has no sorrow, no sickness, no disease, no downtime. Zoe life is the life of God that contains the joy of the Lord. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. The joy of the Lord. That is why the righteousness of the Lord produces joy. That is why Paul, you could hear him almost singing. I talk about the third time. He says, I gladly. Well, that's a different attitude that he has in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, let me finish what he was saying here. 
when God declares my strength is made perfect in weakness there was an impartation he loves God and he has the peace of God now the joy and the grace of God are upon him he says most gladly gladly I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me look at verse 10 therefore I take pleasure look at that joy has come where there is joy there is pleasure and the grace of God has succeeded in producing that and that is why one of the law of coming to God and tapping on the law of grace is knowing that when we are weak when you're down when you're sorrowful when you're depressed that's when we need God because when are we going to get happy when things are working right no you can always find happiness and joy in the Lord for in his presence is fullness of joy therefore when we are in need when we are weak come unto the throne of God where there's mercy and there's the grace of God and don't don't go away from God's presence until you have touched his presence and his love fills you and his peace fills you and his joy fills you don't stop until the third stage the love is only the beginning because when God is love when you come face to face with God you come face to face with love but remain in the love of God until the love of God produces peace and then when peace comes, don't, don't run away. Some people say, oh, I got peace now. And then they run away. But their joy was not full yet. So the moment walk out the door, the devil, you know, was still uh, in the process of being what, being what. And then the peace didn't last long enough, not good enough. And then they topple. And they say, hey, what's happening in my life? Wait upon God until the fullness of His joy fills you saturate you until your heart is so full of grace that Colossians 3.16 takes place you could sing with grace in your heart and when you come forth singing with the grace of God that is when you can easily sing in the spirit too because the difference between praying in the spirit and singing in the spirit is this praying in the spirit you don't necessarily need a tone or tune you just pray but when you sing in the spirit you need a tune I mean you don't sing in the spirit by that's not singing in the spirit <laughs> that's just still praying in the spirit when you sing in the spirit you need a tune not necessarily a full song you know you don't need you know four or five different chords with three minors and, and uh, majors and all that you just need some sort of tune it could be that's still a tune but there is a tune there is some sort of a song coming out from you that's when the grace of God starts operating and that's when we can see the grace of God the church of Jesus Christ is a singing church the grace of Jesus Christ is a singing, singing church. I will close with this scripture and we will carry more on this area the next week. But let's look at Hebrews. There's much more we want to talk in this area, but we will continue the next time, the, uh, in the next session. In uh, chapter, looking over here in chapter 2. It talks about Jesus and then it quoted a psalm. It says in verse 12, uh, let's read from verse 10. For it was fitting for him to whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one. For which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. And again, I will put my trust in you. And again, here am I and the children who God has given me. Now look at verse 12. It's taken from the book of Psalms. And uh, <clears throat> 
it's taken from Psalms 102. It says, I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will sing praise to you. Now, do you notice who is doing the singing and who is doing the praising there? Who is the I? He says, I will sing praise to you. In the context, the I is Jesus, the you is God the Father. You can check it out in the Psalms. Although it's a Psalm of David, it's applied to Jesus. And Jesus is singing praise to the Father. And of course, He represents the body of Christ. And we are the body of Christ. And the body of Christ that has the grace of God. Do you know that the grace of God is so powerful that nothing can overcome it? This is the dispensation of the grace of God. Grace overflows. Grace abounds. Where sin abound, grace abound much more. Where grace keeps abounding and abounding and the enemy has no place to hide. And here he's talking about worship that comes to God, to the body of Christ, to Jesus himself. Do you notice in verse 14, it's connected to the devil being defeated? Look at verse 14. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. One of the major weapons of warfare, where you not only completely crush the devil, but you completely banish the devil. See, it's not just defeating the devil. That's not good enough. Crushing the devil under our feet, that's part of it. Romans 16 verse 20, the devil is crushed under our feet. But that's not where we remain. Matthew 16 says, and the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. You know where the church is? The church is chasing the devil until the devil run and hide in the gates of hell. It is not the devil coming to the gates of the church and we are defending the church and say, oh, the devil is attacking us again. Oh, the devil is attacking my house again. Oh, the devil is attacking my business again. How come always the devil attacks you? How come your whole life story is the devil attacks you? How come you're always all the defensive all the time? Is that the Christianity that Jesus Christ came to bring? He died on the cross. He shed His precious blood. He gave the Holy Spirit. He gave the power of His name. Gave the power of His word. Gave us grace abounding. Gave us all these things. So that the devil always attacking you. Cannot be. Something is wrong with the Christianity. And no doubt, the devil has to be defeated. But when the devil is defeated, you don't want the devil hanging around either. Some people might feel good. Oh, I got the devil. I crushed the devil under my feet. He say, where is he now? He's still there at my doormat. <laughs> no, you don't want the devil to be on your doormat either. You know, every day crushing him. Well, what's the point? I mean, you don't want the presence of the devil. You want to completely remove and abolish the presence of the devil. Which is why you don't stop at peace. You enter into joy. The devil cannot stand the joy and worship of the Lord. You think that when we all sing to God and worship, Amazing grace, the devil is going to come and join you and say, How sweet the sound. <laughs> He can't. He doesn't join in our worship. Oh, when you're singing in the Spirit of God, the devil's not going to join in. That's the time that makes him miserable. When he hears you worshipping, when he hears you rejoicing, to him, it's poisonous. He chokes. It is like an atmosphere he cannot live in. So anywhere you go, anywhere you are, when you begin to lift up your hands and let the grace of God produce singing grace in you. Singing grace. 
and you worship the Lord and you sing in the Spirit because God gives you grace and the grace calls you to worship God, to stand and see the salvation of God. As you lift up your hands, as you worship God and praise God, the devil begins to say, I cannot take this atmosphere any longer, I need cause to go far away. And then he tries to come near again, and then he tries to go far away. Because he cannot stand the atmosphere. We have to produce and live in the atmosphere of praise and worship. And if we are filled with the grace of God, grace produces the atmosphere. Singing grace, I call it. Singing grace. The grace that turns us from weakness where Paul was saying, you know what Paul probably was saying in his weakness? Oh, poor me. Oh, poor me. Oh. And he's suffering. Don't forget he's in pain. He did say, he used, did use the Greek word for infirmities to include physical ailments too. He said, oh. Ah. If he were Asian, ayo. You know. He said, I, I, I do it. He started his grace. Oh God, when, when will you take all this away? Oh God, help. And that really sounds like a sheep's cry. Help. Help. Really crying unto God. And then the second time, still no answer. Help. And then the third time, as he called, God begins to put his strength and says, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace, my strength is made perfect in weakness. And Paul felt energizing. He felt the love of God. He felt the peace of God. He felt the joy of the Lord. And then the same Paul that was crying, and there was a fallen angel. The Greek word actually says anger loss, a fallen angel. The angel that was, whatever the angel, you know, he says, uh, he used the word buffet. And uh, unfortunately, it's the same spe spelling as buffet. <laughs> <laughs> so, he was eating Paul up. <laughs> you know, or whatever. He was torturing Paul, you know, punching or whatever. You know, buffeting in the, in the English meaning, you know what buffeting is? It's like the boxer. Oof! 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 That's what the enemy was doing. So Paul was like, oh, 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 help. Until when the grace of God came upon Paul's life, suddenly he begins to rise. He says, I take pleasure. And the enemy go, boom. He says, <laughs> and then he begins to say, Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And the enemy says, oof, oof. He cannot stand that. And slowly the enemy begins to retreat because Paul rises up and says, I take pleasure in all this thing. No matter how many punches you throw, I take pleasure. Here, have another one here. And you go. And the, the enemy punches. But because now he's surrounded by the grace of God and it's, it's like, it is like poison element to the devil. So as he punches, he goes. Ah! Because it was like touching a force field. Because the joy of the Lord is now there. And the more he tries to buffet Paul, the more he's painful. And Paul keeps rejoicing and says, I take pleasure. I gladly rejoice. He says. And there was a different tone to the whole thing. Because the grace of God has now abound upon his life. He has entered and received grace. There is a grace of God for every situation, for every occasion. And we all can. Now, your circumstances hasn't changed yet. Up to that point, Paul's circumstances hasn't changed yet in 2 Corinthians 12. But his attitude has changed. His spirit has changed. His strength has changed. And that's where it starts the victory. As the grace of God abounds in him, circumstances will begin to change. And sometimes it takes time for the natural world to change. 
But if you are one of those quote-unquote grace singing, grace-filled people, you will sing your hallelujahs to the Red Sea. You will sing your hallelujahs through the wilderness. You won't be like the mixed multitude. Well, all the mixed multitude complain. They want the garlic, they want the leek, they want this, they want that, they want meat, they don't have this, they don't have that. Even the manna, they say, now no good. You will be singing, Hallelujah, manna again. Hallelujah for the meat in the evening. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. And you're praising the Lord. And you'll be one of those crossing the Red Sea with timbrels and dancing, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for He has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider thrown into the sea. And you were singing and praising the Lord all the way. While well, everybody, when they cross over, the first thing they see, no water. They start complaining. But you are one of those who say, Hallelujah! The Lord's going to give water. Even though there's no water. Because in all situations, the grace of God is upon your life. And your whole attitude changes. You've gone from love into peace into joy. And the grace of God abounds to you. That's the law of grace operating upon our life as we tap upon it. The law of the spirit of life. When the spirit of life comes, there is no sorrow. There is no sadness. There is no downtime. There is only joy, joy, and joy. The comfort of the Holy Spirit is the joy of of the Lord and Jesus has come that our joy may be full praise God whatever your situation even if you're fighting a sickness or disease that you pray for a long time and sometimes when things are a long time it makes us sad and perhaps at one time you were joyful but it has not made you sad one of the first things that need to take place even before your physical healing is to discover the joy of the Lord back in your life. If you can get back the joy of the Lord somewhere along the line, the grace of God can abound and there's a miracle waiting for you. Can you imagine how could heaven stop working in your life when every day you're rejoicing in the Lord and thanking God for His presence in your life knowing that God is doing a great work in you perhaps in your life you could have financial situations that really trouble you and I know what it is like sometimes when if you go to situations where you lack and you're in need and every dollar and cent counts and it's so easy to be depressed and down but you take the attitude like, attitude like this to say so what so what if nothing comes true you don't lose your joy in the Lord. So what if you have nothing to eat? Brief air. <laughs> so what? You will rejoice in the Lord because there is a level of grace that can come that will still make you joyful. And if you begin to rejoice in the Lord, I believe somewhere down the track is a great financial miracle. In the same way in areas of your personal life or areas of your family life things try to take your joy away but you determine in God that you will not allow anything to take the joy of the Lord from you you will find the love of God the peace of God and rejoice in the Lord and you keep rejoicing in the Lord somewhere down the line God is gonna make a breakthrough for your home and your family Whatever areas of your life. Perhaps you're struggling in your personal life in a habit. Or you're struggling in your personal life spiritually for a breakthrough. Doesn't matter. Even before the breakthrough comes, the first thing you do is you say, Lord, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will rejoice in your presence. And we live and die in the presence of God. That's all that is important. How important it is. One day in the house of God is better than a thousand days, says David. How precious it is to just enjoy His presence. And think about it. Isn't the presence of the Lord 
everything. Think about it. What is all the money in the world compared to the presence of God? What is all the success in the world compared to the presence of God? What is all the happiness and joy you can find in all the things of this life and this world compared to the presence of God? Isn't the presence of the Lord all that we need and all that He can bring us into? And that's where the grace of God can abound. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank You, Lord. We thank You, Lord. You see our hearts and our needs, Lord, in You. We thank You, Lord. Father, we thank You. You know our situation and You know our life, Lord. Father, we know that each one of us have a different road that we walk, different missions to accomplish in this life, different destinies, but somehow in this church together, our destinies combine to walk together in this fellowship. But yet we all continue to have our individual responsibilities, our individual destinies. And Father, you know all that every one of us is going through in the personal life, in the work life, ministry life, in every area of life. Maybe, O oh Lord, in our midst, or those who are hearing this word, they're going through a situation where they say, I cannot take it anymore. Maybe out there, there's someone out there that says, I don't want to live any longer. Life is meaningless. And they're just praying that they die. There is always hope. And like Abraham, hope against hope. Because the hope of God is stronger than all natural hope. Father God, we know that in every one of our lives, sometimes there are situations. There are things that we cannot change. We learn to accept them. There are things that we can change. You give us the wisdom to change them. There are things, oh God, that we don't know. You give us the wisdom to understand. Father, whatever event or things that are in our life, we know one thing for sure. We all can find happiness and joy. Happiness and joy will not be robbed of any one of us. Because you have come that we might have life and that we might have it abundantly. Yes, sometimes life turns out not the way we expect, not the way we want. Situations turn out not the way we expect, not the way we want. And momentarily, we seem to lose our happiness and our joy. But yet we know, Lord, in you is our fullness of joy. Because when everything of life is taken away, like when Job lost everything, he has only you to cling on to. And he cried out, Though you slay him, yet will he trust you. Father, none of us have been in a situation, maybe some of us have been, where we lost all our children, our family, where we lost all our wealth, where we lost all our influence, where we lost all our help. And there's nothing left but only our faith and trust and love in You. May we find the patience of Job to be able to say, we will yet trust You and love You. May we be able to say, Lord, if everything in life falls up, we still can find love and happiness in You. Because having You is enough. Having Jesus is everything. We thank You, Lord. And perhaps it is in times of trials and testing that we realize, Lord, that we put our hope, our trust, our love 
our happiness upon some things in the natural, upon people, upon surroundings, upon circumstances. And it's only when nothing is left but you that we realize you are all that is needed. You're all that we need. And with you, you can provide everything else that we ever need. With Jesus, we have everything. Thank you, Father. Even right now, Lord, minister into our hearts and our lives to every need, Lord. First, take them into the pathway of love. I pray, Father God, like Jesus prayed for the disciple Peter. When he prayed that their faith will not fail. I pray for those, Lord, under the influence of this ministry. I pray, O oh God, for those who our lives are contacted here and all over the world, that their faith will not fail. They will still find the love for God. And secondly, we pray, O oh God, that they will enter into the peace of the Lord. That the peace of God that surrounds and garrisons hearts and minds will surround all your people. So that they experience Romans 16 verse 20, that the God of peace crush the devil under their feet. And thirdly, we pray that you restore the joy of salvation. We pray, O oh God, that each one will find the grace of God and be able to sing again, be able to worship again, to be able to not let the song of the Lord be robbed from them by the enemy. And we will find a song of the Lord. We thank you, Father, for the grace of God that's upon each one of us here. So stir forth our hearts and songs in you. Cause us to be able to sing and worship you afresh. Thank you, Father God. Praise you, Lord. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all rise to God and just allow the Lord to put a new song in your heart, in your spirit. And just sing unto Him in your own way. Lord, let him cling unto you, Lord. Come to the throne of grace. Oh, and receive mercy and grace in time of me.
will bless you with mine. He will bless you with his power. Oh, the I said, I know. Oh, he will bless the ministry. He will bless the businesses you spawn. For the Lord delights in you. And whom he delights, he will bless. As you delight in the Lord, he will delight in you. And the presence of the Lord, he will make you overcome. We are the overcomers of the Lord. We are those who triumph in him. We are the victorious church. And we'll defeat the enemy. You're not filled with the Spirit, be filled with the Spirit right now. If you're filled with the Spirit, be filled with new songs and hymns right now. Because from today forward, the Spirit will fill you and cause you to speak in some hymns and spiritual songs. And as you speak in some hymns and spiritual songs, you will have your blessings in the natural, in the spiritual. You will have your victory in all that you do. Yes, you will sing your way to victory. You will sing your way to hell. You will sing your way to healing. You will sing your way to prosperity. You will sing your way to success. You will sing your way because you have received the grace of the Lord. And as you sing, the enemy will cause ambushes on the enemy. Oh, and they will destroy themselves without you laying a hand. As you begin to sing, as you begin to praise, the Lord will ambush the enemy. Oh, Ramada Bashe, Kabaria Teria Bashe, cause the enemy to destroy themselves. Narama Mama Seria Teria Teria Tela Bashe, Lala Bashe. For the battle is not yours, but the Lord's. Emeria Teria Tera Raba Bashe, Baria Teria Tera Mama Shara Raba Bashe, Lala Bashe. Nawaria Shana Lala Bashe, Kabaria Teria 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 Tna. Alia Raba Shana Ria Teria Shoria Teria Shara Lala Bashe, Baria Tela Bashe. Yes, out of the mouth of babes, the Lord has perfected praise. And the enemy is fallen like the devil coming, falling down like lightning from the sky. Out of the mouth of babes, the Lord has perfected praise. The Lord will cause you. And what you have done today is but the beginning, say of the Lord. As my people continue in the ways of my spirit, they will see my presence fill the temple of God. 
Yes, my presence is indeed upon you and upon the praises of my people. And I will cause you to know it is not by your works, but by my grace. And this day you know the way and the means, said the Lord, that as you praise me and worship me, stand aside and see the glory of the Lord. For indeed the battle is not yours, but it is mine, said the Lord. And I will conquer. I will overcome because you are my people whom I love. And my covenant is upon you, save the Lord. We thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Seal this upon each one of us, Lord. And let this be a pattern in our life every day. And cause us to understand how simple it is to depend on the grace of God. How simple, yet how profound, yet how powerful to just worship you and stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Thank you, Father. Seal this work in our heart and life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Give Jesus a good clap offering. Praise the Lord. The Lord bless each one of you. Amen. God bless you.